Protestant evangelicals have lost their nerve when it comes to politics, or at least that is what many of their leaders would like them to do, even if that's not uh, the case for everyone. It might seem like a strange thing to say, considering the very strong support for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020 among evangelicals. I think it still bears out in many ways. Uh, it is certainly true that evangelicals on the whole are politically active, but there are many reasons today why they've come to have a fraught relationship with politics. I wanna give just two reasons for this fraughtness. Uh, first of all, uh, there are many opinion-forming evangelicals who argue that if you get vigorously involved in politics, it will lead to a form of worldly-mindedness, uh, even idolatry which will cause Christians to lose sight of what matters most, uh, which is namely their, their heavenly home. Second, there is a popular narrative uh, today that blames much that is wrong with the world, uh, from uh, individualism to secularism and many other things, uh, to the ideological forces that were unleashed during the Protestant Reformation. So it's a very small topic that I'm addressing here with you in 18 minutes. Concerning both of these points, uh, I would say that a healthy dose of Protestant political thought will help evangelicals to regain their confidence uh, to engage contemporary politics without the nagging fear that somehow they are either abandoning or subverting their Christian spiritual priorities. Now, there is a, a rich tradition of Protestant political thinking, and it's one that has had a very strong impact on America's founding and on American political history. But it is a tradition that evangelicals are often unaware of, or at least unfamiliar with today. And it's also not a dead tradition. Uh, there is much that is right and good and true and proper in this tradition uh, that can offer us much for ourselves uh, to think about today. And uh, if, for instance, uh, we were to um, think about the, the goods that the National Conservative Conference is talking about, uh, many, many of the things that are valued by the many speakers at this conference, if some of these opinion-forming evangelicals could convince evangelicals to just check out many of these very priorities uh, of national conservatism would be jeopardized because evangelicals still form a, a very large percentage of the voting bloc in the Republican Party. So you convince them to check out and uh, then you are going to jeopardize much that matters today. Okay, so the first point, the fear that the spiritual nature of Christianity will become corrupted by a focus on this worldly practice of politics. So consider Tim Keller, a very famous uh, evangelical, a prominent evangelical pastor in New York City. And he says this, he says, quote, while believers can register under a party affiliation and be active in politics, they should not identify the Christian church or faith with a political party as the only Christian one, right? And there may be some truth to that, certainly, but I find the title of the article particularly telling. This was an article in the New York Times, and the title was, How Do Christians fit into the two-party system. They don't. That was, that was the title of that article. Christians, in other words, shouldn't take sides in America's political divide. We must be decidedly neutral when it comes to party politics. Although it is curious that social concerns that are palatable to those on the left are often retained under this banner of neutrality. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, consider all, another writer, Joe Carter. He writes for the popular evangelical site, The Gospel Coalition, and his article that he wrote was entitled, How to Know If You've Made an Idol of Politics. And he writes in this article, I consider politics to be, at best, a necessary evil, not something I would put ahead of God. I think all Christians would agree with the latter part of that, I would hope, uh, anyway. Uh, nonetheless, to, to treat politics as an evil, even if it's a necessary evil, 
is signaling something about political action uh, today. Eric Erickson, uh, who was is touted recently as a possible replacement for Rush Limbaugh, uh, he insists that at Christ's return, he won't care who voted. He won't care who you voted for. He won't care about your plan for the national debt. He won't care about politics. And I think the, the, uh, the necessary conclusion that you're meant to come to is you shouldn't either. Now, all these writers, in their own way, they come back to the same basic point. Politics is dirty business. It corrupts the soul. It turns people away from what really matters, salvation, the salvation of the soul, and it turns them towards earthly matters that are of no eternal significance. And that is to say, for, for many at least, politics turns people away from what really matters if one's politics corresponds with the priorities of the right. That's usually the subtext. If one's politics happens to be in line with the priorities of the left, you'll often find evangelical opinion formers straightforwardly equating their views with those of the Bible, caring for the poor, caring for the abused, the marginalized, and so on. Their own political priorities are framed as non-political, as nothing more than the priorities of the Bible itself. Now, this aversion to political action did not define Protestants in the past. And a particularly striking example of this, I'm going to take you a little ways back, is found in the 17th century. A Scottish Presbyterian pastor, theologian, and rector of the University of St. Andrews, Samuel Rutherford. Now, Rutherford was prolific, but he is most famous for two writings. One is a collection of his letters, and the other is Lex Rex, which was a treatise on the nature and limits of kingship. The letters have become famous for their spiritual depth. They've provided special comfort for many who are undergoing persecution and suffering. They're decidedly focused on heavenly matters. At times, we could even say that they uh, approach a kind of uh, mysticism, even. And I don't use that as a, as a slur word um, here. Just it's a, it's a very spiritual body of letters. In one letter, he writes to a woman whose husband had run afoul of the local authorities uh, for his faith, and he writes this. He says, when we shall come home and enter to the possession of our brother's fair kingdom, and when our heads shall find the weight of the eternal crown of glory, and we, when we shall look back to pains and sufferings, then shall we see life and sorrow to be less than one step or stride from a prison to glory, and that our little inch of time Suffering is not worthy of our first night's welcome home to heaven. Now, Rutherford continues in that vein across all 365 of these letters that have been collected. They say, surely someone who is so focused on the next life like that would agree with Eric Erickson that Jesus doesn't care about your politics. Or with Joe Carter that politics is at best a necessary evil. And yet, this same Rutherford wrote Lex Rex, the law is king, in which he sums up his own argument like this, quoting him, that power which is obliged to command and rule justly and religiously for the good of the subjects and is only set over the people on these conditions and not absolutely, cannot tie the people to subjection without resistance when the power is abused to the destruction of laws, religion, and the subjects. But all power of the law is thus obliged and hath and may be abused by kings to the destruction of laws, religion, and subjects. If you hear some resonances with the documents of America's founding, I think that is uh, completely the way you should hear that. Uh, Lex Rex is an extended argument against the divine right theory of kingship which would invert the order of the ti uh, his title to Rex Lex, the king is law. Needless to say, King Charles II was less than pleased. Uh, with the restoration of mandatory Episcopal church government in Scotland in 1661, Lex Rex was symbolically burned at the stake and Rutherford was deposed from all of his offices. He escaped execution only because he conveniently died first 
Rutherford's sermons and his letters and his other writings, they reveal a man who could by no means be accused of failing to attend to the spiritual and heavenly focus of the Bible. And yet he simultaneously applied himself to the burning political issues of the day, acting decisively to attempt to implement the political order he thought best. Rutherford was not abnormal in this. He was not abnormal among Protestants in the past. This widely held evangelical belief that the only faithful Christian approach to very concrete political decision-making is avoiding it would have been nonsensical in previous generations. Frederick de Rosemont, a 19th century Swiss Protestant layman and politician, he captures well this once mainstream Protestant view of political engagement in a book of his from the mid-1840s, which was entitled The Individualists in Church and State. And he writes this, the state, based on the divine institution of political authority or sovereignty and social authority, is an earthly community, the primary purpose of which is to punish the wickedness of its members while striving to advance their well-being in this life with all the means at its disposal. The state, uh, in other words, virtuous statecraft, politics, in other words, matters. It's a, it's a legitimate God-honoring thing for the Christian to be engaged in, and it's important for the well-being of the world, for the well-being of our neighbors. Now, if evangelicals who still make up such a large percentage of America's population, if they shrink back from that task, the void will be filled by those who will do great harm to our nation. And there are, unfortunately, many who, within evangelicalism itself, are, are urging them to do that very thing, to shrink back from that task. Now, the first fear about evangelical participation in politics comes from within evangelicalism itself. The second derives from a historical narrative that is popular among at least some contemporary Roman Catholic writers on politics. Now this story draws an essentially unbroken line from the Protestant Reformation to the excesses and evils spawned by, by modern progressivist cultural and political ideologies. It's certainly too complex of a story to analyze in detail here, but I think it could be summed up by these words uh, from Bradley Gregory, Notre Dame. He says, in brief, the Reformation accelerated a process of increasing control over the church by political authorities that was already evident in the 14th and 15th centuries because the only forms of Protestantism that survived, thrived, and were able to have a major impact on large numbers of ordinary men and women shaping shared religious identities were those that received sustained support from political authorities, Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism. This was a crucial part of a long-term process of secularization Rulers, not church leaders, whether Catholic or Protestant, were calling the shots pertaining to the religion uh, already by the late 16th century. Or one of the, the speakers at our own conference, Patrick Deneen, I think, who would agree. He says, there is ample evidence that liberal democracy and capitalism are what is left once Protestantism is distilled into its ultimate political and economic forms. And he means that's all that's left once you do. To the extent that the political left has taken up the banner of egalitarian democracy and the right defends capitalism, it is arguable that we have reached the culmination of Protestantism's trajectory. Statist collectivism versus libertarian individualism, both being two sides of the same liberal coin. Secularization, statist collectivism, and radical individualism all bequeathed to us by the Protestant Reformation. Now, Deneen is right to note the connection between America's constitutional order and elements of Protestant thought. I would suggest that he's wrong about the link between Protestantism and status collectivism or libertarian individualism. Now, the reason I mention this is to note another of the main reasons why evangelicals have become so averse to serious engagement with political theory and practice. Admittedly, this is more of an academic concern, I think, than the previous one. But deep down, they're worried that Deneen, Gregory, and others are right. 
Admittedly, um, as I said, that, that's more of an academic concern, but it is one that filters down to the lay level in the churches because pundits, pastors, seminary professors, and so on, uh, they're the ones forming the future pastors. They're the ones forming the people in the pew, and they do much to, to form how they think about politics. Right? And if you can convince uh, them that their view of political action is not respectable and that it's actually unleashed all of these horrible forces in the modern world, they might shrink back just that much um, from uh, the classic way that Protestants have talked about politics and about government. Now, I can't respond to that narrative exhaustively. That's not even uh, my intention here, but I can sketch out an alternative uh, proposal very, very briefly. And this is one that I think would do much good if it was reintroduced into the mainstream of evangelical thinking on politics. Historically speaking, it's undeniable that Protestant political thought significantly impact and influenced America's founding principles. Edmund Burke was correct when he wrote in defense of the colonists in 1775 that, quote, the people are Protestants and of that kind which is the most averse to all implicit submission of mind and opinion. This is a political theory uh, this is a persuasion not only favorable to liberty, but built upon it. That's the end of the quote. Whether it be the covenantal political theory of the original New England Puritans, or the influence of the Protestant theory of the resistance to tyrants, and what uh, that theory had on the crafters of the Constitution, Protestant ideas, sometimes in, in less overtly biblical terms, have significantly impacted the development of federalism, checks and balances, and the justification for resistance to oppressive forms of government. And to illustrate that, to illustrate that impulse, I just want to briefly comment on what is probably the most famous sermon in American history, Governor John Winthrop's 1630 sermon, uh, which we know as the City on a Hill sermon, but was originally called a model of Christian charity. Now, the whole sermon is an exposition of the proposition, and I quote Winthrop, that God Almighty in his most holy and wise providence hath so disposed of the condition of mankind as in all times some must be rich and some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in subjection. Not exactly a ringing endorsement of liberal equality. It is, however, an honest assessment of the natural differences that exist in the world. But Winthrop doesn't argue for a kind of libertarian acceptance of natural inequality. Instead, the entire rest of the sermon calls on his hearers to take it upon themselves to attend to the needs of others. For example, we read that the powerful in the world must learn to restrain themselves in their treatment of those who are less powerful, that the less powerful must learn contentment with their station in life. His hearers are exhorted to show their mutual interdependence with one another, thus stirring up mutual affection for one another. As Winthrop puts it, quoting him again, now the only way to avoid shipwreck of our colony and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection we must be willing to abridge ourselves of superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. Now, this is the legacy of Protestant political theology, specifically the legacy of a covenantal view of the political order, one which carefully defines the responsibilities of citizens to one another and the responsibility of rulers both to God and to those that they rule over. And his sermon presents a distinctly Protestant vision for society, whether one agrees with every point of his theology or not. It's a vision in which the governmental power of the colony is to be used for good, even though that power is divinely limited, and in which there must be a self-sacrificial orientation toward the welfare of the whole community, dare I say it, the common good. It's a vision that continues to bear fruit throughout America's subsequent political development. I would say it's a far cry from status collectivism or libertarian individualism. I'm not trying to suggest here that uh, one sermon proves anything, but this mindset is found across a wide variety of Protestant political thinking across the ages, where there is an emphasis on ordered liberty under law, 
law that binds sovereigns and citizens alike and which orients them all to the general welfare of society. It's a good example, too, because it's not a theoretical treatise. It's the words of a leader of a new colony preparing them with what he deemed necessary for life together. So as I draw to a close, I'll register my agreement with Samuel Goldman in his recent book, After Nationalism, when he says, quote, that the hopes that the New England Covenant can be revived as the source of modern American identity are implausible. But I also agree with him when he says, again quoting him, that it is not to say that we cannot learn from the New English Covenant. It was the most coherent attempt to develop American identity from within English history and Protestant political theology. At its best, it combined a generous hope for national flourishing with a sophisticated appreciation for the social and economic preconditions of self-government. That is the legacy of Protestant political thought in America. And it's one which has much to contribute to the challenges of today. And evangelical Protestants need to recover this rich heritage to learn how to apply it creatively today. Writing off politics as unspiritual simply won't do, nor will delegating serious political reflection and engagement to non-Protestants, which has been the norm in evangelicalism for some time. Here we stand, I would say, and we can do no other. Thank you.